Uh, so let's look at Luke 14, Luke 14, verse 1. I want you to think on this thought tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. A hands-on healer. That's who our Lord is. He's a hands-on healer. Uh, and so we're looking at these miracles. Just want to remind you, I know I may, this may, uh, there may be a bit of redundancy in what I'm about to say, uh, but I do want to remind you that we're speaking about uh, the miracles of Jesus because uh, we believe that they're recorded in God's Word for a reason. Uh, we believe that He's still a miracle-working God today, uh, and we believe that uh, if He worked miracles uh, then and there in God's Word uh, in Palestine, that, uh, that He's still working miracles today because the Bible teaches us He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But we also believe these individual miracles... Uh, we believe they're recorded, uh, not only for our benefit, but for our situation or where we are at if we happen to need a miracle in our life. Now, we find biblical miracles, they're really life-changing things. It's generally not a miracle because someone has stumped their toe or cut the end of their finger off or anything like that. Uh, but usually, very life itself depends on Christ working a miracle in their life. And we find that he does that over and over and over. Some 34 times miracles are performed in the Word of God by the hands of our Lord or by our Lord. Uh, and then there's about eight or nine times when he performs these crowd miracles where he just heals everybody that's sick. Uh, so many times it's recorded. But each time we find a miracle, just like tonight, we see, that, that we see a picture of a hands-on healer. Uh, each time he heals, uh, we believe that uh, it directly applies to our life in some way. Maybe not me tonight, maybe not you, but quite possibly your neighbor beside you or someone on Liberty Live. And so that's where we're at tonight, Luke 14, uh, verse number 1. And let's look at the text tonight. And the Bible says, And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread, uh, on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Now, dropsy is edema. Uh, it's basically the result of a bad heart uh, or some type of heart condition. Could have been born with it, could have developed it through the years. Uh, and uh, it's just basically fluid gathering in the midsection of the body, in the legs, and in the feet. We call it today edema. Uh, and so that's what it was in the day of Jesus. Verse 3, And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees. Now, now notice though, when Jesus is answering, uh, nobody asked him anything, but yet he's answering them. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him, and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit, and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And so we see this miracle here. So I want to say a little something about this miracle. I want you to know, notice first off the setting. Uh, and the setting is this. This whole meal at this Pharisee's house, uh, this whole meal at this Pharisee's house was a setup to set up Jesus. Now stay with me. Uh, and so this Pharisee, now remember the Pharisees, basically what you need to know is, is they were this group of, of these very zealous religious folks, uh, and they believed that you had to do this and you had to do that, and they had this list of things that you had to do uh, or God wouldn't accept you or be pleased with you and you could not worship Him. Now, really, uh, listen, there's some churches today that are, are, uh, are really churches of the Pharisees, because they say, if you don't wear this, you can't come to 
our church. If you don't do that, then you can't come here. If you don't, uh, you know, they've got this list of rules that you have to follow. And believe it or not, there are churches like that. I know uh, personally of a few of those churches. They're very much like the Pharisees. Like if you didn't just abide by what they thought was right, not really Bible, this is extra biblical stuff, uh, but if you didn't do what they thought according to their list, you can't go to church there. But so these Pharisees, though, I want you to notice the setting is this. They're trying to set up Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, the, the man that needed to be healed with dropsy, with edema, he would have ordinarily not even been allowed in that home. They would have turned him away as fast as they could turn him away. Not only would they not touch that man, uh, and not only would they not touch a blind person or a deaf person or a mute person or a man with leprosy or a man with a withered hand or a woman with an issue of blood, they would not touch those people because they believed they would become unclean if they touched any of that kind of people in society. That's another image of some of our modern churches today. Truth be known, some of our modern churches are so modern today, and I hope liberty is not this nor ever becomes this. But if your average beggar or drunkard off the street wanted to come and attend, they would not be welcome in some of our churches today. One man come to a church and he was very, very poor and down on his luck and he shows up in an old pair of clothes and he smelt and he didn't have on any shoes and so he come right in and he walked right up to the front and he sat down in the floor up next to the front pews. Preacher got finished preaching and he grabbed one of his deacons and he pulled him over to the side and they pulled that man over to that and they said, listen, sir, we, we want you to know something. We, we really don't dress like that around here uh, and we don't sit in the floor and and we don't come in barefooted. Uh, and so what we want you to do is, is we want you to leave here and we want you to go and ask Jesus what he thinks about the way you look and the way you come in here. And after you ask Jesus that, then you get things right. You can come back next week and join, join us and worship with us. The next week, the man shows up still down on his luck old raggedy clothes, no shoes on his feet. He comes in church and sits right back down in the floor up front and it just made the pastor furious because this was an upscale church where everybody had it together, so he thought. And after the service, he got a few more deacons together, grabbed that man and took him to the side and said, uh, Sir, did we not ask you to go and talk to Jesus and ask him what he thinks about the way you're dressing and coming into this church and sitting in the floor and behaving as you have behaved in our church? And he said, yes, sir, I did. And the pastor said, well, what did Jesus tell you? He said, Jesus told me he wasn't sure what the dress code is because he don't go there either. You'll think on that. I know it's Wednesday night, hump day. You'll get it about 2 a.m. in the morning. Don't call me or text me that you finally got it. But these, these Pharisees, not only would they not touch individuals who were sick and down on their luck and on the down and outs, but they believed if their shadow even crossed the shadow of such scum as those kind of people, sick, blind, deaf, mute, withered hand, issues of blood, leprosy, things like that, they believed if their shadow even crossed the shadow of that kind of people in society, they would run straight home and they would go through a ceremonial cleansing to cleanse themselves of even being within the shadow of someone's shadow. And so that's how we know that this was a setup. The Pharisees would never have someone with edema inside of their home. And we know it also from verse 1. So verse 1 says this, And it came to pass as he went to the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him, they watched Jesus. And so that little phrase, they watched him, quite literally in the Greek, it means to watch intently with the intent to judge. So what they did was they developed this plan. They said, listen, here's what we're going to do. Because we believe this man heals on the Sabbath and he breaks the laws. 
And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to bring Jesus. We'll invite him. But then we're going to get that man that's got edema so bad down the street that we see every day and we pass by every day because he too's like the blind man and the man with leprosy or the deaf man or the mute man. No social systems of the day. The doctors couldn't cure him. They didn't have Lasix back in those days to drain that fluid off of him. Uh, and so uh, what we're going to do is, is we're going to go down and get that beggar with the demon. We're going to bring him in the house. We'll sit him over away from us so we don't have to touch him or cross his shadow, but we'll bring Jesus here and we'll just watch and see if Jesus is going to touch and heal this man on the Sabbath. That little phrase they watched intently, it's that same phrase that they used in the book of Acts, that Paul used in the book of Acts describing what the Jews did when they laid outside the city of Damascus and they were waiting on Paul to come through, the newly converted Paul, because they had heard that he had got saved and got his life right, uh, and they didn't like what he was going around preaching about Christ, the risen Savior, and so they developed a plan to catch him and kill him. And it's the same phrase that Paul uses over there. They, they waited at the gate of the city, and they watched, and they watched so they could catch Paul when he come out of the gate of the city. And so that's what they were doing at this meal. They were watching. And they were waiting on Jesus to mess up and do something. That's what the enemy does. And so the Bible says, and then there was this man there that had edema. And then the Bible says, And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They didn't say a word. But Jesus answered their thoughts. So they're sitting there watching intently, waiting. They're waiting to judge Jesus. And they're thinking about it. I hope he does it. I hope he sees that man with the demon. I hope he sees that sick man. And when he sees that sick man, I hope he tries to heal him. Because if he heals him, that's against the law. That's against our law on the Sabbath. No healing on the Sabbath. That was their thoughts, and Jesus knew their thoughts. And so he answered their thoughts by asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or is it not? Because he wanted an answer from them. And you know, that's the thing about our Lord is, he knows our thoughts and he knows the intent of our heart in everything we do. He knows our thoughts and the intent of our heart. And that's why we can do all of the right things that we are supposed to do, but if we do it with the wrong heart, then we might as well not do it at all because he knows our thoughts. The widow's might is a good parable on that because the interesting thing about that, and it's, a, it's really a, a tithing message, uh, and I, and I would love to preach it again sometime. But in that text where, where wealthy people are coming through and throwing a little bit into the offering plate, uh, and then this little widow comes through and she gives all that she has in that widow's might. It, to give her tithe to the Lord cost her far more than it was costing the rich people. And, but the Bible says Jesus is standing over and he's watching. He's watching the offering plate. And he knows the intent of people's hearts. And he knows that those rich people that are coming around, he knows they're doing what they're doing to be seen. She did what she did out of all of her living because she just loved the Lord. And that parable is very clear, that, that teaching is very clear that, that the Lord was watching that and he saw the intent of the heart. So our actions can be totally right, but if our intent in our heart and the thoughts in our mind are wrong, then we might as well never done that deed that we did or that act of service that we did because it's all about our hearts because he knows our hearts. So... He asked them a question when he sees that man with dropsy. Of course, they don't answer him. They don't say anything. They don't know what to say. And the Bible says, And he took him and healed him and let him go. 
Then Jesus, of course, asked him a very difficult question. He says, if you have an axe or an ox that falls into a pit, are you not going to go straight away and pull him out on the Sabbath? And, and they couldn't answer him again. They still. Have you ever had one of those times where somebody asks you something and you need just a little while or you wished you'd had a little while to really think about an answer so you could give them a good answer? Or you may even tell them, give me a few minutes, let me think on this, and I'll come back to you on it. Uh, and, and so there's moments like that. He had given them that kind of moment. But they still couldn't answer his question because they knew they were wrong. Because here we have the picture of a Savior who's wanting to heal and help people. Uh, and they are not wanting people helped and healed on their particular Sabbath because they think it's wrong. And so they know that sick people need to be healed, ought to be healed if they could be. But now they're in this dilemma but because it can be six days of the week but not on their Sabbath day. So what do we do? So they had no answer for the Lord. And so they tried to, they tried to catch Jesus uh, in a trap and it didn't work. So let's, talk, let's, look at, let's approach it like this. We could say a lot of things. Let's approach it like this though. So... Our enemy, when I started thinking about a trap, we know that our enemy, that he sets traps for us. We know he's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We preached on that the other sun, several Sundays ago, maybe a couple months ago now, uh, about how that he does not walk around roaring, waiting, uh, or uh, walk around walk around roaring, hoping to catch prey. He only roars after the kill. But he's as, he is as a lion looking for those that are, are weak, those that are outside the herd, those that are young. Uh, and, he, and he hopes to catch them. And he waits on prime opportunities to catch them. We know the Bible says that, uh, that he sets snares before us. Uh, the wiles of the devil, the Bible speaks of. That's the, that's the snares of the wicked one. And when I was a kid, I'd, I'd learned to make, when I, I don't know, I was pretty young, six, seven, maybe eight years old, I'd learned to make snares by uh, just, a, some, uh, just a pocket knife and, uh, and some small uh, cord uh, or a rope, some very fine rope, and, uh, and a sapling. And... Uh, Man, I set, I set snares all over the San Luke community, up and down Richland Creek. There wasn't a lot of people lived there then, still very rural, and, and I had traps everywhere. And Man, I caught everything from possums to coons to house cats. If it was to be caught, I caught it in, in the snares that I made. But I took great pride in, in making that snare, and I could lay that thing out, uh, and uh, I could camouflage... Uh, that, that catch loop and everything was set just right. An animal had no clue what it was stepping into when it stepped into one of my snares. Now, now my brother-in-law and I, we had this uh, plan to develop a snare one day uh, and, and make it so big that it would actually catch a man. I'm just glad that that plan never went through and we never caught a man because I probably wouldn't be here today had we done that. Uh, but that was definitely in the works and in the thinking and in the plans. Uh, and so that's what the devil does. He sets these snares and he's trying to catch us. And he doesn't want us to see the, the pitfall, if you will. He doesn't want us to see the snare. He doesn't want us to see the trap. Uh, but he sets it for us. And maybe it's somebody you know. Maybe somebody you know has been caught up. Maybe somebody you know has been tripped by the devil, by the wicked one. Maybe somebody you know is under attack. Maybe you are under attack. Maybe you know the devil uh, is as a roaring lion because he's hunting you and he's stalking you and he's, he's, uh, he's quickly closing the distance of pacing you down. And I want you to notice what the Bible teaches us, though, in this text. The Bible says that the man, Jesus took the man uh, and he healed him and he let him go. Very clearly, the text is telling us uh, in, the, in the Greek text that the Lord took this man and he put his hand on him and he healed him. He put his hand on him and he healed him. Sometime in your personal study, you need to go study 
uh, the eight or nine times that the Lord actually touched individuals to heal them. There's something very, very powerful about touch. And, and the Lord knew this. And we see Pharisees who would not touch a sick individual, who would not even let their shadow cross paths with the shadow of a sick individual. If their shadows touched the shadow of a sick individual, they run home and went through a ceremonial cleansing. So we see the Pharisees, and that's in stark contrast to our Lord and Savior who didn't mind touching those who needed to be healed. We see some of those miracles. We see that he touched lepers, number one. We see, number two, he touched Peter's mother-in-law uh, and healed her. Again, the very fact that Jesus can heal a mother-in-law is evidence that he can work miracles. Amen? Oh, you bunch of men are scaredy cats because your wives are sitting beside you. Number three, we see that he touched a deaf mute. Uh, number four, he touched two blind men to heal them. Number five, he healed a man that was born blind by touching him. Uh, number six, we see that he healed uh, Malchus' ear, the servant of the high priest there in the garden when they went to arrest Jesus. Malchus pulled his, uh, uh, he, he was getting ready to be part of the crowd that arrested Jesus. And Simon Peter pulled his sword out and he cut off the ear of Malchus. Well, the Lord uh, healed that ear and restored uh, that ear to that, uh, that servant. Uh, we see that Jesus touched little children. Remember, they were bringing little children to Jesus. And he was lifting them up, setting them in his lap, touching them and blessing them in the process. And the disciples, they got aggravated by it. They're like, don't, don't, bring, don't, get, don't bring the children around. Don't bring the kids around. Our Lord's tired. He's weary. Take them away. Get them away. And remember, the Lord was so angry about that. He rebuked his disciples. And he said, don't, don't stop kids from coming to me. Don't stop little children from coming to me. Because he said, because of such is the kingdom of heaven. Out, I don't know in God's economy how he's got this worked out. That's how we know, though, that there's children in heaven. Because Jesus himself said, that's what heaven is. That's what heaven's like. There's children in heaven. Don't stop them from coming to me down here. But the Lord put his hands on them and healed them. Uh, and then the frightened disciples at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, those three that were part of that uh, inner disciples, remember, four groups of three. Peter, James, and John was the head group uh, of those four groups, and Peter was the head of the group. But at the Mount of Transfiguration, when the glory of God was revealed there, it scared them to death. And the Bible says they fell as dead men. But what did Jesus do? Jesus come along and he touched them. And he calmed their fears. He brought peace to their heart. And he lifted them up and allowed them to, to stand again. So what we see in this miracle is this. We see the enemy, the Pharisees, and the religious system of the day. And then we see uh, the trap that was set, just like our enemy. Uh, and our enemy does use the religious system still today in all of our churches. I, I've uh, become friends with a gentleman who, who had some trouble from the religious system at, at a church he was pastoring. He didn't know that, that within that church... Uh, there was a deep, deep history uh, of religious people who caused trouble because they owned the church. Their great-great-grandpappy laid the cornerstone and then their granddad built the new church and all that kind of stuff. And so there was this religious system that ruled the church and he found that out a little too late. Uh, and he had some trouble in the church and he just told me the other day, he said, he, he said he's not there anymore, he had to leave. And he said, it's so bad, it was so bad there that he said, I, I will never be able to go back there and even conduct a funeral in that church because of the religious system. So we have this enemy and he uses religious people, he uses snares and traps and, and deceit uh, to, to trip up his people. He, he, he likes to bring us down. He likes to steal our joy. He likes to bring burdens and trials to us uh, that are greater than we can bear. Uh, he'll touch us physically. We learned that last week, that it's very possible for the enemy to touch us physically and to make us sick uh, and to touch our minds and, and give us mental unrest and mental instability, to touch us emotionally. The enemy has great, great power. He's far more powerful than you and I. We need to understand that. And that's why, when, uh, that's why when you hear somebody say, well, I rebuke the devil. 
or, uh, or I'm going to rebuke the devil. Let me tell you something, that's not found in the Bible. And you better be careful when you're going to say, I've got the authority to speak to the devil and tell him to leave me alone or, tell, or to rebuke him. If you're going to do that, you better be very clear that you do it in Jesus' name because that's the only name that's greater uh, than the enemy himself. And so the devil's greater than you and I, but he's not greater than the Lord. And so he trips us up. He sets traps for us. He gets us down. I've recently uh, come across several videos on YouTube. You know, YouTube has an algorithm, so once you like watch one video, say, of changing the oil in a Ford truck, there's now going to be 40 videos come up of changing the oil in a Ford truck, and that's all that'll keep coming up. In fact, I got one better for you than that. Mike, here's a conspiracy for you, but it's not conspiracy. Lay your phone beside you and speak about some random things. Speak about Danner Boots about how you need to buy Danner boots and how you like Danner boots and how they're the most Danner boots are the most comfortable thing you ever wore. And you watch, if you don't start getting pop-ups in your emails or you don't start getting uh, uh, in the algorithm of YouTube, you will start getting advertisements and uh, in ads for Danner boots. Now, how's that happen? Because they're listening. Anyway, that's a little side note for you there. That didn't cost you anything unless you want to just drop a dollar in the plate at the door, and then I will go get me a blizzard after church. But listen, the enemy knows, and he sets traps. But what I want you to see tonight is this, is I want you to see that we have a God that's greater than the enemy. And we have a Savior who it's his manner, it's his style, and not only that, but according to God's Word, it's His past performance to where He loves to put His hand on folks in need, folks who are sick, folks that are hurting. He loves nothing more than to touch them and make them whole. And so tonight, if you're watching on Liberty Live, and if you're here tonight, and man, you just... You just need a touch from the Lord. Then you should bow your head somewhere, whether it be here or whether it be at home or when you lay down tonight and say, Lord, you know where I'm at. And the enemy has just got me down. I, I'm tired. I'm tired physically, Lord. Lord, spiritually, the enemy has beat me down and I'm exhausted spiritually speaking. Father, mentally, the enemy has rode me and rode me. Emotionally, Lord, what I have went through, the attacks that I have been under from the enemy, it has me exhausted and fatigued, emotionally speaking. And Lord, I know that I could do like the doctors say. I could pop a pill. Lord, I know that I could call a friend. I could call a psychic hotline. I, I could go see the preacher or the pastor. Lord, I know I could do all those things. But Lord, at the end of the day, those things may or they may not work. But Lord, the thing I know that will work is, well, if you'd just touch me, Lord. And for most of us, it would be this. Lord, if you'd just touch me again, like you did before, when I went through another trial, another burden, another heartache. And so we have this Savior, this darling Savior. He is a hands-on healer. He doesn't have to. We've seen the miracles. He just speaks and the miracle happens. All he really has to do is just think the thought and a miracle could happen. But we do see when you're talking about nine miracles, just out of 34 recorded individual miracles, we do see that, that he quite often loves nothing more than his loving hand a hand of compassion and care upon an individual who just needs a touch from the Lord. And he provides it and does it and heals and restores and makes whole. And then as this text says, he sends them on his way. So he wants nothing more tonight because we're in this text. This is not random accident. We're in this text. He wants nothing more than to touch you tonight. And those on Liberty Live listening, watching today, tonight, tomorrow, next week, he wants nothing more than to come to you and give you that touch. Why? Just so he can work a miracle? 
just so you can be the recipient of a miracle? No. No, so he can restore you whatever's ill or broken or hurt, wherever that wound is, so he could restore you, so he could raise you up to send you out serving and working for him. So you, in turn, can take your hand and lay it upon somebody and be an encouragement to them. Dear sister, you ought to go to that sister that you work with in the cubicle next to you or the office, or, or the office uh, on down the hall or at the coffee pot. You ought to walk up next beside, beside that sister and lay your hand upon her shoulder. Let her feel your touch and say, Dear friend, is there anything I can do to pray for you? How can I help you? And dear sir, you ought, to take that, you ought to take that brother that's a friend of yours and do the same thing. I've told you before, I went to an ele- just, just several weeks ago, I went to an elevator uh, one time at the hospital, long story short. As I started to speak to the man, to ask him how he was, God said, don't just ask him, but put your hand on his shoulder and ask him how he's doing. And when I touched that man, as soon as I touched that man before I could even get out what I was saying, he began weeping because he was in need of help from a brother. And so there's a Savior waiting tonight to touch you, to heal you, to make you whole from a Savior who is best at hands-on healing. Father in heaven, I thank you that in these texts, I thank you in the miracles that we read from Scripture, that you're a Savior who cares, you're compassionate, and Father, you don't shy away from those who are in need. But Lord, you draw close and you lay a loving hand upon them and you lift them up as you've done me so many times, as you've done your children, seated all in this church in times past. And God, we know tonight that you want to do the same thing. Touch, restore, heal, refresh, revive, and then send them on their way to do your work, kingdom work. Father, we love you tonight. Touch that brother or that sister that's here in a special way so that they will know that surely someone has touched me. And it's been the hand of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Stand up and tell somebody you love them tonight. You'll be praying for them. Thank you for joining us on Liberty Live. We'll see you Sunday morning.